Good afternoon. It's great to see everyone. Welcome to the IHPI Member Forum for 2022. Uh, it's actually been two years uh, since we've been able to gather in person like this. January of 2020, we had our member forum. And then last year in March, we had a virtual member forum. So it's, it's great to be back together. Uh, we're recording today's session for people who can't join us in person this afternoon and want to welcome everyone who's here today and hope that you'll be able to stay uh, both for this session from three to four, as well as our networking session, where you'll actually have an opportunity to meet with IHPI staff and faculty who are leading different programs within the Institute and learn more about how to be engaged. Uh, we'll be starting with my State of the Institute address um, and then moving to uh, Professor Sarah Hawley presenting our education and training recognition and then we'll wrap up here with our policy impact awards. Uh, we'll then take a short break for people to move downstairs to the South Atrium where we're set up for a networking gathering and uh, reception and we hope uh, all of you can join us for that. Uh, and there we'll be talking about IHPI initiatives and resources in smaller groups, more personal conversations. It'll also be an opportunity to reconnect with colleagues and we look forward to that. So where are we with the State of the Institute? Well, uh, first and foremost, we wanna thank our leadership team, which is our um, strategic uh, uh, guidance for the Institute. Uh, four members of the leadership team have uh, finished their terms of service in the past year. Uh, Vineet Chopra, John Pate, Lisa Prosser, and Andy Ryan. Uh, we will be presenting them with a token of our appreciation, a, a Michigan cutting board uh, engraved with HPI on it. So we uh, look forward to sharing that. And then we also want to welcome the four new members of the IHPI leadership team, Steve Brolio, Lori Buis, uh, Ramesh Nalia, and Akbar Walji, who's also taking the baton from Andy as the faculty lead for our data and methods hub. And then we want to highlight some updates about our national advisory board uh, that generally meets in the late fall providing us with a national and global perspective on the work of the Institute. Three ongoing members of the Institute have taken on new leadership roles in their uh, professional work, uh, Linda Elam, Garth Graham, and Jonah Caldoun. And then two members of the board have finished their terms of service in the past year, Jim Haveman and Lisa Simpson. So we wanna thank them. So we remain a collaborative and innovative community. Uh, we're now up to 678 members, uh, including over 650 faculty and 27 clinician scholars. Uh, and we've had 56 new members join in the last calendar year. Uh, we are uh, represented across 15 schools and colleges at the University of Michigan on the Ann Arbor campus, as well as the Dearborn and Flint campuses. And our members are leading $1.2 billion of active research here at the university, over 10% of the university's whole research portfolio. So uh, one of the main services we provide is helping people uh, to develop their grants. And over the past two fiscal years, uh, that has been a very important part of the work we've been doing virtually and our staff and uh, working with faculty across the Institute. Um, our um, staff in this area have uh, contributed to over 80 uh, career development and research proposals in terms of helping the faculty leaders with their writing and editing and, and developing a, a strong proposal. Uh, we've also provided over 60 letters of support. Uh, when, when you write about the institution and the environment, IHPI is an important part of that, and we help you to characterize that in those letters of support. Uh, and then finally, our members have been successful with over 250 new grants in the past year, totaling over $160 million. So uh, really a, a credit to the collaborative efforts of our faculty and staff. Um, we've continued to grow over the past decade. Uh, at the end of the last fiscal year, we were at 666 members, and we're very pleased that about one third of our membership is represented by early career faculty, and I think that's a group that really brings a lot of energy and vibrancy to the Institute. 
Last summer, as we were preparing for our five-year renewal, which is happening this spring in the, in the review of IHPI's progress since the last uh, five-year renewal in 2017, we surveyed you, our members, about the value that you receive from IHPI, what you might recommend that we pursue and, and develop within the Institute. And these were just some of the quotes uh, that we received from you as members, uh, dozens of members who responded to that survey. Uh, and it really speaks to the collaborative culture that we're all working to create and sustain here at the University of Michigan with IHPI being an important part of that. And really breaking down the silos that often we find on university campuses and, and making this a, a productive and exciting and satisfying place to work. We're also working to keep our community connected, particularly during the pandemic when so much of our work has been virtual or in a hybrid format. Um, we've developed um, early career faculty meet and greet sessions, uh, coffee with me as the director, uh, and mentoring office hours with other senior faculty in the institute. Um, we've developed faculty peer mentor groups during the pandemic, and I think that's been one of the most productive ways for people to stay connected. And just this spring, we've launched a new IHPI walking and running club that meets on Thursday afternoons, uh, led by Erica Solway, uh, and uh, meets at Gallup Park uh, uh, just down the road here. And then we look forward in the fall, September 24th, to restarting a tradition that we've had for the past five years or so, uh, minus the last two during the pandemic, and that's our fall tailgate, uh, which we'll have uh, before the Maryland game on September 24th. Um, one example of the peer mentoring groups that we've created is the, the PhD faculty peer mentoring group shown here, uh, enjoying a meal together. And uh, the running and walking club is also shown in uh, just in its early days. And we welcome ideas from all of you about other peer mentoring groups that you think we could help to support. Uh, it's, I think, a, a way for faculty to stay connected in specific domains. Uh, like our institute leadership team, we really look to our early career faculty advisory council for new ideas, for leadership, for energy around programs that we're conducting. Um, the current members of the leadership uh, of the early career faculty council are shown here, chaired by Sue Ann Bell from the School of Nursing. Uh, we want to welcome four new members of the uh, early career faculty council that have joined during the past year. And we want to thank three members who are finishing their terms of service on the council this spring. Um, one new development that uh, really shows the, the, uh, the impact of, of the work that we can do is, er, for early career faculty is a new philanthropic fund that has been established this spring, the, the Lou Sandy and Sue Hassmiller Early Career Health Services Research Fund. And there's currently an open call for new proposals for grants up to $10,000 uh, to provide pilot funding that can then support the, the development of larger grant applications. And that uh, call for applications is open open till July 15th. And if you would like further information, Jody Moore is the staff person leading that initiative. And in terms of other activities within the Faculty Advisory Council, um, the, over the past year, the Early Career Development Roadmap has been uh, further developed and refined, led by Mike Mathis and Michelle Moniz. Uh, the Emerging Scholars Exchange Program has continued over the past two years, and this spring we've sent Jeff Hoffman to the University of Pennsylvania and Elham Mahmoudi to University of California, San Francisco, as well as hosting colleagues from each of those two universities here at the University of Michigan. Uh, and then finally, back in January, we had a very successful uh, early career faculty workshop focused on designing your career for impact, and that was organized by Mike Mathis and Clayton Schumann. Education and training remains a very active part of our portfolio as well. I mentioned earlier the mentor office hours, one coming up a week from today, is focused on using the IHPI roadmap tool to effectively plan for promotion and future career impact. And Mike Mathis, one of the developers of that tool, will be uh, available to guide colleagues on, on using it. Uh, this summer, we're going to have skill building sessions for students who are working with IHPI faculty on summer research projects. And another new program that we've launched in partnership with the Office of Faculty Development is the Faculty Success Program that's currently underway, uh, a 12-week program to help people maintain a, a healthy work-life balance. Uh, so if you have questions about any of these programs or others related to education and training, Jason Wolf is the staff person uh, leading these efforts. 
Uh, we really want to give a shout out to the National Clinician Scholars Program. It's been a tough two years with so much of that postdoctoral training occurring virtually. Uh, but um, our 2020 cohort starting two years ago and our 2021 cohort starting last summer are shown here. And we're looking forward to welcoming another cohort of six clinician scholars this summer. And I wanna highlight, uh, if you know of any potential candidates for our clinician scholars program, applications have opened this month for the cohort starting a year from July. And uh, uh, it's open till July 15th. And there's information available on the NCSP website. Um, it's a sort of bittersweet time in that we're saying goodbye to two of our co-directors of the National Clinician Scholars Program and thanking them for all they've contributed. Uh, Jack Awashna is uh, moving uh, from the University of Michigan this summer to Johns Hopkins University. And Dina Costa is moving from the School of Nursing here at Michigan to the School of Nursing at Yale University. And they've been really important leaders of this program and we'll thank them for their contributions and uh, wish them well in their new roles. Uh, three other faculty who are continuing, not leaving the University of Michigan, but uh, moving on from their leadership roles within IHPI uh, this year include Chad Elamoodle, who's been leading our telehealth research initiative for the past two years, Eve Kerr, who's the founding director of our Michigan program on value enhancement, uh, which started back in 2017 and continues to go strong. And then Dana Tellum, who for the past two years has been leading our workforce diversity and health equity initiative. So we thank them uh, for the important leadership that they've provided. Um, we're also this year celebrating our national poll on healthy aging, which was launched back in 2017. So this year is the five year anniversary of the poll. Uh, it's been very productive. Over 50 members have contributed to polls and publications coming out of it. Uh, we've produced 45 reports, 18 peer reviewed publications in high impact journals, and as well as nine academic journal blog posts uh, over the past five years. Uh, we've also moved to be more nimble with poll extras. Uh, we've produced, with Kara Gavin's help, nine of those uh, looking at very um, short sections of the, of the national poll that have particularly timely information with a few examples here shown related to flu shots and the role of pets during the pandemic and delayed care due to COVID-19. And we've also heard from some of those 50 members who've worked on the poll and collaborated with our team leading the poll uh, about how it's helped them in terms of obtaining grant funding, connections with the media, and an opportunity really to elevate their research with these nationally representative data that we're collecting in partnership with the Michigan uh, Medicine Department of Communications and ARP. And we'll actually be celebrating that five-year anniversary um, um, two weeks from tomorrow uh, when we have a, a nationally uh, broadcast webinar on optimizing health and well-being as we age. Um, we will uh, welcome Louise Aronson, who's a geriatrician and noted author at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, Vijeth Iyengar, who's the Director of Global Aging at ARP, and Preeti Milani here at IHPI and Chief Health Officer at the University, who's the Director of the National Poll on Healthy Aging. So please mark that on your calendars. and uh, We uh, look forward to uh, learning from the insights of of uh, these important colleagues uh, talking about the role of the poll and the general uh, need for uh, promoting healthy aging. Uh, and related to that, in this past year, we've launched our Aging Research Network, uh, which includes over 100 HPI faculty members, uh, led by Julie Bynum and Courtney Polinek, as well as Erica Salway from HPI staff. Uh, we are partnering with uh, aging organizations here locally to provide a lecture series on the art and science of successful aging that has been running since January of this year and featuring several IHPI members. Um, another major initiative that's, that's very active and we wanna highlight is our Workforce Diversity and Equity Initiative with over 100 faculty participants. As I mentioned, Dana Tellum has been serving as the faculty lead for over the past two years. And the six faculty colleagues shown here are the co-leaders of three important work groups uh, that are um, uh, advancing this initiative for, within IHPI, focused on inequities in care delivery, co-led by Erica Newman and Sharia Robinson-Lane, on recruiting and retaining diverse leaders, 
co-led by Jade Burns and Tom Valley, and on career advancement and leadership development, co-led by Evan Dotson and Antonio Scumpius. Uh, so if you're interested in becoming involved in this initiative, uh, uh, Emily Coulter Thompson is our staff lead uh, supporting the initiative, uh, and she would welcome uh, hearing from you to, to become involved. And the work groups are all actively continuing the work in these three domains. Um, another major initiative is our telehealth research initiative, uh, which has been very active, as I mentioned, led by Chad Elamoodle. Uh, it's been helping uh, our faculty to develop multi-research grants that have been funded, for example, from HRQ and the Michigan Health Endowment Fund. Uh, its uh, group has produced a series of telehealth research snapshots to disseminate the findings of our faculty around telehealth, and they co-organized and co-led a joint symposium uh, with uh, colleagues in Israel in February of this year around telehealth, sharing lessons learned from telehealth in the United States and in Israel. And Emma Steppe is the, uh, the staff colleague who is supporting this initiative. Uh, and then I mentioned our Michigan program on value enhancement. The, uh, the leadership baton has been passed from Eve Kerr to Jeff Barnes and Leslie Dossett as the new co-leaders of Improve, and they're continuing to support multiple partnerships that we have across Michigan Medicine to promote greater value in healthcare delivery and to reduce low value care. Uh, so it's both a research and an implementation program uh, that um, has been very effective in, in building work in this domain. Um, shifting gears to our policy engagement and communication efforts, um, we continue uh, with the um, uh, leadership of Eileen Kostanecki and Sarah Wang from our uh, staff team uh, to produce policy briefs in collaboration with our communications team, some of which are shown here. Um, and these really help to disseminate research in ways that policymakers, the public, the media can understand effectively. Uh, we've also just recently completed our latest call for policy sprints, um, which uh, this spring we're focused on advancing health equity. Uh, four uh, teams were uh, awarded policy sprint awards, uh, shown here, focused on pain treatment in the emergency department, uh, treatment for opioid overdoses, uh, support for adults with sickle cell disease, and uh, abortion care access in Michigan. And so uh, these groups over the next three to six months will be uh, following in the path of prior policy sprint teams, developing rap rapid cycle evidence that can be used and shared with policymakers and others to inform important decisions. Uh, and we want to just uh, give you a heads up that in the next academic year, we'll be developing and launching a new program on policy and communications training for IHPI members. Uh, the program is actively in development. Uh, watch for a call for applications this summer, and it will include a series of interactive training sessions to help uh, IHPI faculty members develop more effective skills around communication and policy engagement. And we're excited about that new program that'll be launched in the coming year. Uh, in terms of our data and methods hub, it remains one of the most highly valued parts of IHPI's programs and services. Uh, we're uh, playing a leading role with colleagues across the university in upgrading the university's research cloud computing system. Uh, and then we've also acquired new data sets, particularly focused on Medicaid uh, through Truven and IBM uh, Health Analytics and through CMS uh, in partnership with some of our IHPI members who are active leaders on Medicaid focused research. And then a new program that we're developing within uh, the uh, Data and Methods Hub and just announced yesterday in an email that you hopefully received is our Data and Methods Hub Fellowship Program, which is calling for applications both for projects that our fellows could work on uh, sponsored by faculty, as well as applications from fellows who are envisioned as recent graduates of master's programs in biostatistics or data science or information science. Uh, who would receive a, a, a fellowship support from IHPI to work with an IHPI faculty member. So uh, please check uh, your email if you have uh, questions or would like more information. Uh, email our data hub uh, uh, address shown here on the slide. And those call for both faculty proposals and uh, fellowship applicants are open till the end of this month. 
Another area of focus in the past year has been developing um, a greater support around equitable methods and promoting equity in health services research. Uh, led by Matthias Kirch from our staff team, we're looking to bring together our faculty from across campus who would like to focus in this domain on developing better methods for research questions related to race, ethnicity, um, and other inequities in the system, um, and then to develop resources to help uh, our colleagues tackle those, those questions more effectively. Uh, another area where behind the scenes we've been putting in a, a substantial effort and I think it's starting to, to bear fruit is our increased focus on philanthropy and um, working sort of year round to cultivate and engage donors and make them more aware of the important work that IHPI faculty and our research centers and programs are doing. Um, three examples here of well aware webinars for current or potential donors um, that we have uh, developed in collaboration with our colleagues from the university development team, uh, focused on telehealth, on healthcare reform, and on the future of the pandemic as we shift more to a, an endemic phase of COVID-19. Uh, so many faculty have been involved as speakers and presenters in this webinar, in these webinars, and we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from the, the, the folks who have uh, been able to, to participate. Um, and we're now developing a philanthropic advisory board. This is something we've consulted with our national advisory board and our IHPI leadership team on uh, to help position IHPI for an effective uh, uh, fundraising effort within the university's capital campaign that's expected to begin in the next one to two years and uh, build a foundation for uh, the growing number of gifts that we're starting to receive to support the work at IHPI. And then stay tuned for this fall. We're hoping to have a, um, a, a Philanthropy 101 training session uh, led by Vince Cavatayo and colleagues from our development uh, office um, and helping you to think about how donors could uh, be engaged to support the work that you're doing and, and how to tell the story of your work in a way that, 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 that donors will find it uh, appealing to support. Another way that we're trying to spread the word about work here at IHPI is partnering with our University of Michigan Alumni Association, which has over a half a million living alumni of the university and all its schools and colleges. And um, earlier uh, this academic year, back in September, um, we were actually invited by the Alumni Association uh, to participate in the first ever takeover of their website. And our communications team and policy engagement team pulled some of the most important highlights from the work happening at IHPI recently. And um, that information went out in an email to over 177,000 alumni who are, have been identified as having a particular interest in health or health care. Um, and we saw, and we were drawing them into some of the resources that we have on our website, uh, videos, issue briefs, uh, our, our uh, online course that we offer for University of Michigan students uh, related to understanding the US healthcare system. And we saw a lot of activity and interest from alumni uh, seeking to learn more about uh, the work of IHPI. Also want to highlight since our last member forum about 14 months ago, we've hosted two annual director's lectures. Uh, last year it was a, a virtual event, a, a conversation with Dr. Sanjay Gupta, uh, moderated by Preeti Milani. Uh, we had, uh, I think over 2000 viewers, both live and of the recording that we provided uh, of, of that, uh, that conversation. And more recently, just a month ago, uh, we hosted Dr. John A. Khaldun, a member of our National Advisory Board, and uh, until last, uh, uh, recently uh, served as the Chief Medical Officer for the uh, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and we had a lively conversation about her role during the, in, in promoting public health during the pandemic, uh, and that's available on the IHPI website uh, with hundreds of people who've already, who've already viewed that, that event. Uh, so moving forward, the theme of today's session is on reconvening and reconnecting our community. Um, we're uh, looking for this to be interactive, both um, um, in, in this session now and especially in our networking session to follow. We're, we're always looking for your ideas about how IHPI could be more effective in, in uh, promoting collaboration and, and high quality uh, research and policy engagement. Uh, and we have the email address shown here, ihpifeedback at umich.edu uh, for uh, any ideas that you'd like to share with us uh, for us to move forward. 
Uh, so with that, we have time about 10 minutes or so for questions, comments about how things are going. We received a few questions in advance uh, that we can address at today's session, but I want to see first if we uh, have any questions from those of you who are here. I think we have one or two microphones available. Uh, because we're recording, we would ask you to uh, use the microphone when uh, presenting your question or comment. Tim. Um, <clears throat> give you a tough one. It seems to me that the single biggest health policy issue that's going to be facing us for the foreseeable future is the, the evisceration of Roe versus Wade and, the, and what that's going to do to the practice of medicine, the consistency of medical practice across the United States, access to you know, care and equity. Um, and I mean, I know there's a, I see Lauren has a sprint that's just devoted to that, but it seems to me that this might be an issue that is bigger than that. Um, I, I almost can't see much poli anything in the health policy range being talked about mm. other than that in the next, you know, certainly in the next six months through the election and probably after that. So I was, yet obviously it's sort of a minefield and so I was wondering what, and I'm sure it must have, you must have been talking about it with the leadership of IHPI in anticipation. So I was wondering what you were willing to share with, because a lot of us are wondering what, what we should do. Yeah. I mean, it's a great question. I'd welcome thoughts from you, Tim, and others here today. Uh, you know, certainly we've been following sort of what's happening with the, the Supreme Court case, and, you know, and uh, we haven't really had a chance to discuss in any depth sort of the, you know, since the news report came out with the, you know, the draft opinion uh, that, that's being circulated uh, in the past day or so. Uh, you know, we, as, as I said, we've, one of the policy sprints among, you know, a, a very strong uh, competitive group of sprints uh, that we funded specifically focuses on what could happen if Roe v. Wade was overturned in terms of geographic access within the state of Michigan uh, for women who, who uh, might be in need of uh, abortion and reproductive health services. So, uh, you know, I think it's something that we're going to have to, you know, wait and see, you know, while we sort of learn more about sort of what the ramifications could be. Uh, you know, obviously we have to see whether the final court decision is consistent with what was in that draft opinion. And, uh, you know, that's probably likely, but not certain uh, that that will be the case. And uh, so, you know, I think it's something that we can uh, begin thinking about, uh, you know, Oftentimes when topics come to the fore, and we did this two years ago as COVID was, was uh, really uh, taking off, you know, we started bringing on short notice faculty together who were interested in the topic and sort of thinking about, you know, what evidence needs to be brought forward and policy engagement. So I think that, you know, in this domain that we would take a similar approach, uh, you know, and, and welcome input. You know, we already have, uh, you know, a, a very strong community of researchers focused on, on women's health and reproductive health. And so I think we'll also look to them for leadership and guidance on, on this issue. Other comments or questions? Well, I'll, um, one that came in advance, and I might turn to Sarah Hawley to, to help uh, address this one, was um, how might the institute support early career members as they transition to mid-career? Uh, programs like the R01 boot camp and proposal development support are fantastic. Is there anything else in the pipeline or that we could be thinking about developing? Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> Thanks. That's a great question, and it's very timely. Um, we've actually just been talking about this in our work group uh, because it's come up a few times, and so we feel like we're at a place in education and training where we can start to think about that topic and how we could offer something. Uh, the first thing that we're thinking about is uh, kind of capitalizing on our mentor slash uh, thematic office hours. We've kind of um, shifted from a mentor only to a theme over the last year, and we're going to continue that um, into the fall and winter of next year. So we're going to have a couple of those focused on early, uh, mid-career, new mid-career faculty, sort of like launching your first R01, or you just became an associate professor, now what kind of things. And so we may be reaching out to some of you to help us um, populate those and, and help us think about how to structure those. And then from there, hopefully building more opportunities for that group. Great, thank you, Sarah. And Sarah serves as the faculty lead for IHPI 
education and training programs and chairs our uh, working group on education and training and also serves in that role as a member of our IHPI leadership team. So uh, it's certainly in an area that, you know, I think we've had great success, for example, with our K award support and R01 boot camp and even transitioning to R01 prior to the R01 boot camp. But uh, there's opportunities now as uh, many people have succeeded in that early career phase of even being more successful in their mid career. And we are looking to help with that. Other questions? Uh, can take one other that we received in advance, and I might call on Trish to uh, comment on this, our managing director, Trish Meyer. Um, how will IHPI facilitate hybrid meeting space for teams to work? Do we have conference room, conference room set up with updated cameras and audio to allow both in-person and virtual team members to meet collectively? <laughs> I get the question that I won't have a good answer for, but um, I don't know if folks have been up on the fourth floor yet. They are starting to put in larger screens and new systems to facilitate, facilitate hybrid meetings. I've been trying to get an answer about the timeline and plan for the rest of the building. I have not yet gotten an answer about that, but we will continue to pester and um, it's definitely on the radar screen so but if anybody wants to come up to the fourth floor and take a look there's um, some of us have been using it there's still a few technical glitches but they're they're trying to make progress so that to make the zoom hybrid meetings a little bit easier but we will continue I mean obviously that's going to be a big piece of bringing people back into the building so that's a priority for us as well and I think, you know, what we're doing on the fourth floor with the support of the technology team is prototyping. And, you know, it's not meant that, you know, only those conference rooms will be uh, updated, but sort of develop, you know, as we learn what works and how to implement it, we'll be trying to do that throughout IHPI's conference room space. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Samir. Great. Um, thanks, John. Um, it's great to hear about all the sort of the new initiatives. Um, one of the ones you mentioned was around sort of like the policy engagement communication. Could you or someone on the team talk a little bit more about that and sort of, you know, what that might look like? Sure. I think it's a, it's a really important skill set. Yeah, so, so that's something that, you know, really developed out of from our policy engagement and communications teams sort of seeing that there was interest and, you know, uh, from faculty in a more organized uh, approach to that training. Uh, so they are actively working on the curriculum. We're envisioning that being, you know, somewhere on the order of eight to 10 interactive sessions, probably each lasting 90 minutes to two hours over a several month period. And, uh, you know, we'd be looking for uh, faculty to, um, once the call for participating goes out uh, this summer or early fall, then looking for faculty to express interest, you know, and commit to being part of a cohort uh, that will go through this training together. And uh, we're still finalizing some of the details of the content and the topics. It builds on some, you know, individual sessions that we've had in the past around social, working with social media or the news media or engaging with policymakers, um, how to com communicate our results visually and, you know, with graphic images and, and whatnot. Uh, so we'll be looking to build on that and sort of uh, put those topics together in a more organized curriculum and in a more interactive way where uh, faculty can learn together and, and develop and practice those skills. I was going to add that we are also doing focus groups with faculty to get input. So if you're interested in participating in a focus group or if you know others who might be, Eileen Kostanecki and Sarah Wang are working on that. So we'd love to get input as we're still continuing to plan and finalize the details. Great. Any other questions before we move to the next part of our program? which is our education and training uh, recognition, which uh, Sarah Hawley will uh, present. Okay, great. Thank you. It's really so great to be here in person. I've been going in a little bit to the fourth floor and uh, it's not quite as populated as it is out here. So it's really great to see so many faces. Um, it's also really a privilege to be able to present this part of the member forum. Um, we have just 
so many volunteers that come together to help us make successful education and training programs, which is such a big priority of IHPI. You heard John talk about some of the successes of some of our programs, but we really couldn't do it without all of our members who offer their time and energy to help us make these programs successful. Um, I would uh, want to take a minute, though, and thank um, the staff who have really been critical behind the scenes, making sure that these programs do run successfully. Jason Wolf, Stephanie Jared, and Emily Calder Thompson have been just critically helpful in kind of, as we've pivoted from uh, in-person to virtual programs, it may have looked seamless kind of to all of you and people who are participating in the programs, but a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure that that happened successfully and couldn't have done it without all of them. So we have 57 IHPI members who have volunteered during the past year. Um, these folks, many of you potentially in the audience, um, some of you I can't totally tell because of your masks, um, but you've helped us with K writing workshops and the R01 boot camp. We've had reviewers and moderators for the K and R mock study sections. We've had facilitators for our transition to the first R01 workshop, which was one of our new and really successful programs that our third one is starting tomorrow. We started it. Um, right after the pandemic, and now we're on our third one with 21 people registered, so we're super excited for that. Um, we have presenters at our student skill building seminars and advisors for our education and training work group. So, and as you can see, this is just really a reflection of IHPI. We have volunteers from all of our schools and departments. Um, I can't, unfortunately, probably name all of you, but if you are here and you're in the audience and you're on this slide, please stand up. I know you, people don't like to be recognized, but we would really love to recognize any of you who are on this slide. Please take a moment. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate your time. Um, we also have some special thanks to 13 IHPI members who volunteered for multiple programs. Um, I'm also not gonna read through them, but if those of you are on this slide, um, please also stand up because we know that takes even extra time and energy and we greatly appreciate it and want to recognize you. None of you are here. Okay, we'll recognize you anyway. And of course, um, if you're interested in volunteering, please reach out to Jason Wolf. Um, we would love to have you. If you have ideas for education and training, reach out to us. Um, if you have interest in volunteering, we can plug you in to one of those programs. We're also, as I said, starting up some new programs. So we'd love to have more volunteers. Um, I want to put in a plug also for our R01 boot camp. Uh, we have an IHPI version. We partner with the medical school. Um, our 2022-23 cohort is open. We have, a, we have some spots left. So the application is formally closed. But if you are thinking about your first R01, um, upcoming and you'd like to start working on it in 2022 to 23 and join, um, please reach out to Jason and we'll get your application um, submitted because it's a really great opportunity with Noel Carlazzi and Lene Darbs who are our coaches and we've had great success with that program getting people their first R01s. So just had to plug that real quick. Um, thanks so much and I'm going to turn it back over to John um, for our awards. Great. Thank you, Sarah. So this is a very fun part of the IHPI member forum where we recognize and honor uh, colleagues who've had particularly notable impact with their work in policy. Uh, and this year, uh, it's my pleasure to present the awards for uh, accomplishments during 2021. Uh, this is an award that we've had since 2014 to recognize outstanding faculty whose work has had an impact on health policy or practice at the local, state, national, or global levels. Uh, I'd like to thank this year's award committee that included IHPI members Reno Tepernini, Sue Ann Bell, Kuja Lagasetti, and Andy Ryan, along with Christina Coe from the University's Office of Federal Relations. Uh, the annual award, uh, Impact Awards, recognize research that addresses pressing health or healthcare questions and has directly informed health policy or practice. So it goes beyond publishing in academic journals. Uh, the recipients of this honor have actively engaged with policymakers or key policy stakeholders. 
so it is my privilege to announce uh, this year's recipients, Dr. Michael Schoding, Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine, and Dr. Allison Lin, uh, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry, as our 2021 Policy Impact Award winners. So I'll give a brief uh, introduction and uh, uh, summary of their accomplishments uh, that led to this award. Uh, first, for Dr. Schoding, uh, he's honored for his important work demonstrating the clinical importance of racial bias in pulse oximetry and continued engagement with key policymakers and stakeholders to inform regulatory and technological changes to address this bias. Drawing on his clinical observations from caring for a diverse patient population during the first COVID-19 surge here at Michigan Medicine, Dr. Schoding led a team to investigate bias in pulse oximetry using Michigan Medicine's electronic health record data. Uh, together, they found that pulse oximeters fail to detect black patients needing more oxygen twice as often as failing to make this detection in white patients, which has profound implications when using pulse oximetry as a key triage tool in the care of COVID-19 patients. Their work was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and covered nationally and internationally uh, by outlets such as the New York Times, NPR, CNN, and BBC. Uh, in January of last year, uh, Senators Warren, Wyden, and Booker formally wrote to the FDA raising concerns about racial bias um, and they, after being briefed by Dr. Schoding and his team. Uh, after that, the CDC cited the findings in their update of COVID-19 guidance, and the FDA issued warnings about the accuracy of pulse oximeters. Uh, Dr. Schoding's work has also had an international impact. The United Kingdom's health secretary cited his work when announcing a nationwide review of racial bias in medical devices. So, Mike, congratulations, and please uh, join us on the stage. Oh, Thanks, John. Yeah, so uh, I'll just say a few quick things. Uh, firstly, I'm honored to receive this award. Uh, I can't thank the IHPI community enough uh, for this honor. I'd like to say quite definitively that I am a product of the IHPI community. So, you know, I was a fellow here in 2013 and 14, 2015. I participated in the, uh, the master's program as part of the clinical scholars program. Um, I've had incredible mentorship from this community, both uh, faculty mentors and then peer mentors. So really like this work that I was able to accomplish, I feel like in many ways was enabled because of that, because of that training um, and because of the mentorship team and everyone here. And I'll also say one other thing, which is that you know, some of your, it seems like when you read the his, history of science, like some of, some of the best research is really serendipitous. So for me, that was definitely the case, right? Like I didn't really plan on having a career studying pulse oximeters and, and, and measurement bias and pulse oximeters, but really I was just in the right place, in the right moment, in the right time, with the sort of the right skills to actually answer this question in a meaningful way. So again, I, I think that's a tribute to the community and uh, the training that I've received here. And I'll, t I'll do one other special shout out to uh, my primary research mentor, Jack Washna, uh, who I don't think is in the audience. Um, and so I just wanna thank him specifically for, for his mentorship, sort of who enabled this work. And I think we're all really grateful for uh, his, his mentorship to, to, to our community, and we're sad to see him moving on to an, another opportunity, but we're grateful for all the investment he's made. So thank you very much. Oh, Mike. Um, cool. Thanks. Thank you. And I'd also like to recognize Dr. Allison Lin. Uh, she's honored for her work using large healthcare data sets to identify disparities in substance use disorder treatment and outcomes. She uses these data to develop novel telehealth research interventions to improve access and health outcomes. She brings a unique lens to this work as one of the few addiction psychiatrists conducting health services research nationally. She's improving care in the real world for patients with substance use disorders by translating evidence to inform policy and practice. 
In addition to conducting this research, she's directly engaged with key stakeholders and policymakers, particularly at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and through state and national organizations, including her role as current president-elect of the Michigan Society of Addiction Medicine. She's worked with numerous state and national stakeholders to inform telehealth policy, informing policy changes for telehealth coverage for substance use disorders in California's Medicaid program. Dr. Lin has served as an expert consultant for the National Committee for Quality Assurance and others, and recently developed a toolkit on telehealth for opioid use disorder for the U.S. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to inform next steps in policy and clinical care. Finally, Dr. Lin has led key studies on overdose in the veterans population that have informed VA policy and practice. Dr. Lin, congratulations. Thank you, it's great to see everybody here today. Um, it, it's funny, this morning I was actually at my other first uh, real in-person event after two years as well. Um, and it's really just nice, um, a breath of fresh air, I would say, to actually um, be in person, even though most of my research is actually on telehealth. Um, I'm very grateful for this award. Um, most of all, I wanna thank our great team um, of both collaborators and really research staff. Um, I'm lucky enough to work with a very diverse team from statisticians to research therapists, and those are the folks who make the work fun um, and make it worthwhile to write grants. Um, I also, very similar to Mike, want to say exactly the same thing that you did. Apparently, um, I don't think it's a coincidence, but both of us have been products of IHPI. I went through the master's program. I've been through so much of the training programs. And honestly, it's hard for me to separate kind of the benefits I've gotten from IHPI than any other aspects of my faculty career. Um, most of all, though, I want to say a special thanks because I think IHPI helps me continue to prioritize impact um, in my research work. This is not something that comes naturally to some of us. Some of us actually feel more comfortable writing research grants, designing, developing randomized controlled trials. Um, however, I work in the field of substance use disorder care where 90% of my patients um, do not receive treatment even though we have long had effective treatments out there that can save lives. And so even though I can spend you know, five years to do effectiveness, implementation, pragmatic trials, um, they're really pressing questions right now and um, naturally I might not be the person to say oh my gosh I'm gonna tackle all of these things but due to the help and services of IHPI and helping to disseminate work help with communications bridge connections for example to the telehealth network here it really makes it possible and it doesn't um, seem quite as daunting so thank you congratulations So that's always a very fun part of the member forum for me, and I hope for you as well. And I uh, look forward to others in the audience receiving this award in the years ahead, and some of you who may have received it in past years as well. Uh, so now I want to turn to Trish Meyer uh, to just describe uh, what comes next in our afternoon gathering. Sure. So we are going to now move to a slightly more interactive aspect of the forum, and we hope all of you will join us. We're going to be moving downstairs to the first, the ground floor to the South Atrium. We have people outside to show you the way if you've never been there before. Um, we have a very low-key, no-stress networking activity. So for people who hate those, this is really not bad. And if you choose to participate, it's not mandatory, but if you choose to participate, there is IHPI swag available at the end of the Yellow Brick Road. So John's holding up T-shirts. Shirt. I think there may be socks. So yes. definitely worth giving it a try. Um, and also, if there's anything you heard in John's presentation that you have questions about, or if you want to meet some of the people involved in these initiatives, we're going to have staff manning tables down there. We'll also have a lot of the folks who are involved, faculty, so an opportunity to learn more. Um, and just more importantly, an opportunity to reconnect with people that you may not have seen for a while, you may never have seen in person, some folks who are new. So uh, we really hope you'll take the time for the next hour or so and join us in the South Atrium. Finally, there's also a headshot booth outside of this room. No appointment necessary, right, Christina? Just if you want a new headshot, easy peasy, just walk outside and then come down to the South Atrium. So thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. Yes, Thanks. And thank you.